He said he wanted to be advisor to the Goro project in New, in New Caledonia, like where they're dredging through a river with some big truck and you know yeah, devastating yeah. the landscape. You know, I, I mentioned the Woodgrove stage flotation reactor, so that would be one improvement. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mining Now. I'm your host, Jared Downey. Joining me is Gaudi Molina. Hello, Gaudi. Good morning. Good morning. Good and good morning to anybody who's actually watching this in the morning. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be, we're doing sort of a mini series within Mining Now. CIM has put together a list of um, speakers and experts from their industry, from the mining industry, that are going to be, uh, and we're, it, it sort of coincides with promoting CIM in 2021, which is May 3rd to 6th. So, Gaudi, I'm going to hand it over to you. Let's start off with what CIM is up to, mm -hmm. and then go over to our other sponsors. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's not forget um, CIM 2021 Convention and Expo is coming to you this May, like Jared said, May 3rd to 6th. And as a virtual event, it has never been easier to attend. Get insight from industry leaders like Anglo-Americans Mark Kutafani, Caterpillar's Denise Johnson, Torx Gold's Jody Kuzenko, and many more. Explore mining operations through virtual site tours. Find the solutions and the expertise you need with technical talks, Q&A sessions, and of course, the CIM Expo, Canada's mining marketplace. Again, May 3rd to 6th, you can register today at cim.org. Um, moving on, we are also sponsored by RudEye. Um, RudEye is a high-tech company which offers cutting-edge geophysical measurement services using unmanned aerial vehicles. RudEye's tailor-made field survey service services consist of magnetic field measurements and data processing, geophysical data processing and modeling, thermal and infrared imaging, aerial digital elevation models and volume esti uh, estimations, and much more. Red Eye services are suitable for a wide variety of applications like mineral exploration, geological mapping, environmental monitoring, and much, much more. Visit their website at www.redeye.fi. Once again, that is redeye, R-A-D-A-I dot F-I to learn more. Next up, we are also sponsored by Savina Equipment. Savina Equipment supplies new and used mining equipment around the world from placer to underground to ore processing plants. They have gold concentrating tables, trommels, and mineral jigs in stock now to take advantage of the high gold prices. You can visit SavinaEquipment.com where you will find more equipment every day. And of course, please do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to find um, all our episodes. We've got two episodes a week on there. So again, so subscribe or contact us, info at crownsman.com if you would like to be part of the show. And last but not least, we've got Power Zone Equipment. When you need a specialized team of world-class engineers for your oil and gas pipelines, dewatering, or any fluid handling needs, you want to visit powerzone.com. In addition to their inventory of rebuilt pumps, motors, engines, they also have an amazing team to design and engineer your systems, no matter the challenge, no matter the location. Get in the zone with PowerZone. Visit them at powerzone.com. All right. Thank you very much, Gaudi. I did it. <laughs> yeah, there's a few now. Um, okay, so we're going to jump right into it. I, I don't usually read bios before the show, but before we're going to have um, Dr. Nathan Stubina on. And I want to just, because we're going to be covering so much ground, I'm going to make an exception, read a quick bio mm -hmm. so that you, the audience, has an understanding of, of who Nathan is and just the scope of his insight into the mining industry. And then we're going to really dig into some topics. So um, uh, Dr. Nathan Stabina joined Sherit International as Vice President of Technologies in November 2008. Prior to that, he was Managing, managing Director of Innovation for McEwen Mining. With 30 years of international industrial experience, he also worked as ver at various mining project, mining companies, my reading today, including Barrett Gold Corp, Naranda, and Falcon Ridge, Falcon Bridge Limited. Um, and then uh, Dr. Stabina holds a PhD in metallurgy and materials from the University of Toronto, and a bachelor in engineering in mining and metallurgical engineering from McGill University. He is currently a member of the Association of Professional Engineers of Ontario. Um, he's a past president of Metallurgy and Material Society of CIM and a member of Lausanne Institute of Mining's Advisory Committee at the University of Toronto. I probably missed some things, but that's a snapshot. So um, needless to say, some of these questions that I have are going to be a a answered by an expert. Nathan, welcome to the show. 
Thank you so much. Glad to be here. It must be a little bit strange having to sit there and listen to someone read off <laughs> yeah, who you are. Well, I was going to thank you for the kind introductions, but I wrote them myself. So uh, thank you for that. <laughs> Same with my bio. Um, okay. Um, you've had a lot of experience in the mining industry. And that's why I wanted to do the bio, because I think there's, there's just, I wanted to be able to dive right into topics with you. Um, when we were talking before the interview, I said to you that we've sort of, we get new innovation and efficiency conversations, but I, I think that you and I are able to have a conversation that goes a little bit deeper. And so I want to kick off by asking about the innovation of mining. Has it, is innovation and mining, do they really go hand in hand? Of course, that, that is sort of the, the, what is getting trumpeted a lot, but what is your view on it? Well, I once wrote an article for the Northern Miner, and the title was, Is Mining Innovation an Oxymoron? And so I argued both sides of that equation. So uh, people always ask me, is mining innovative? And, and the answer is, in general, yes. Like For any technology that you'll see in civil society, you can find examples in mining. That could be blockchain, that could be AI, that could be VR, that could be AR, uh, just genomics down, down, down the line. So if somebody asked me, you know, can you give me an example of some innovation in mining? The answer is yes, we use all of these things. But the problem is the adoption is not that uh, fast. So it's it's like you could find examples of blockchain and you could find examples of AI and you could find examples of robotics. But at the same time, you can go to a number of mines where you'll see, you know, equipment from 150 years ago and, and you know, archaic practices. So on um, I could argue both sides of the of that coin. And in fact I do, depending on you know the question that's asked. So yes, we're innovative, but no, the adoption is too slow for, for my point of view. Um, let's jump, jump into some of the, I, I want to talk about the big ones, you know, the ball mills, the float cells, um, you know, these, these mainstays that have really been around. I mean, I, I don't even know. I don't even know when the ball, min, ball mill came on, on, on the scene. Um, but, but can we talk, let's, I want to jump right into that one. Um, sure. you know, where is the ball mill been, which is a key part of the mining operation um, till now? And are there really, realistically, are there alternatives? Right. So it would be rare to visit, you know, almost any mine site and, and not find a ball mill. So to answer your question, if you held a hackathon in 1850 and asked them, how would you grind up rocks, they would come up with the ball mill. And in fact, you know, it's been around for, for around that, that length of time. Uh, the problem fundamentally with the ball mill is the efficiency of it. So you know, people will argue the number, but that's that's not the point. So let's say 5% of the energy that you put into the ball mill will go into what you're trying to do, which is grind up the rocks. The rest of it will go into noise or heating up the slurry or grinding away the, the, the balls or grinding away the, the, the shell, which, you know, is not efficient. So, you know, if people said, if you had free energy and you had free water, then you know the ball mill is perfectly fine. But when you explain to people that 5% of the energy is actually going into what you want to do, then you know it doesn't sound like a very efficient uh, piece of equipment. So uh, it's the standard you know, unit operation you know, in, in most mineral processing plants. And the second part of it is, yeah, there, there are alternatives. People are looking at alternatives. Uh, for example, there's the uh, the uh, conjugal a uh, anvil hammer mill, the CAHM. Uh, there's been technologies that have been around decades, EPD, electropulse disaggregation. Uh, for example, there's a company in Switzerland called Selfrag, and they've been looking at it for, for many years, and it's used in uh, uh, precious uh, uh, stones, for example, rubies or semi-precious stones, rubies and, and diamonds and so forth, where you want to break the host rock, but you certainly don't want to break the, the valuable uh, uh, ruby, for example. Uh, it's used in industries like uh, concrete, where they want to remove the rebar from the concrete so you'll blast away the rebar so it's it's very selective and it could be used in mining and people have looked at it where you want to uh uh remove the 
waste mineral, but leave the, the, the calcopyrite as an example intact. Uh, there's other ones where people have looked at microwaves. So you weaken the host uh, uh, minerals and people like, uh, uh, you know, Queens University, Chris Pickles, people like Aaron Bobicki, who was at U of T, but now is in, in Alberta, uh, who, who have looked at it for, for many years. So yeah, there, people have looked at it, uh, alternatives to the ball mill, but there's not really a lot of examples where people have made the, the step of using any of the three technologies that I just mentioned. Why, why is that though? Is it, is it um, that at the end of the day, testing at that scale, um, what, what, is the, what is the big roadblock? Uh, part of it is demonstrating it at scale, but th there's many, uh, many reasons. And I could write a book on, on, on you know, the hurdles that, that innovation faces in mining. Uh, for example, it would be, mining is very capital intensive. So it would be hard to get uh, something pushed through a bankable feasibility study and get uh, the bankers to, to provide the funding for a new technology. Uh, you know, we're talking about some big projects that are, you know, the billions, uh, several billion dollar level. Uh, the other ones would be the EPCMs. It would be hard for them to design something new put a guarantee on it for throughput or costs or, or anything that, you know, you would be interested in because it's, it's a new technology. Uh, just the mindset, uh, you know, like uh, the, there's a, the expression, everybody in mining wants to be the first to be second. So they'll, they'll want to see it in operation somewhere. So the way around that would be to not try it on a $5 billion project. Uh, a friend of mine, Boyd, Boyd Davis from KPM, you know, said, well, why don't we just get a, a small gold mine for $10 million and try out new technology? Uh, the worst you're going to do is break even because you're producing gold at this gold mine. And you'll have a chance to try the ball mill in conjunction with the, the cam at a small scale. And that, that's not a silly number. I mean, when I was at McEwen Mining, the, the Magistral Mine in Mexico, the whole mine was purchased for $13 million and has made hundreds of thousands of ounces of gold. So, you know, not everything has to be at the billion dollar level. And I think that would be one way to overcome the resistance where you would try it at a reasonable level and you can get several you know, companies to put in a million each to get to the 10 million or 20 million to buy this so-called mine and, and try technology, but people don't tend to think that way. Yeah. And I was, so I want, and I want to clarify that is that, so let's say there wasn't, yeah, the, the money wasn't a problem. And I, I know this is, you know, this is sort of pie in the sky stuff, but if the money wasn't a problem, you know, proofing it that before it goes into service, wasn't an issue. Is there the technology? Could you go into a gold mine? Could a major mine, if they didn't have any to answer to shareholders and anything like that, could they invest billions of dollars and do it with the technology that's available? Yeah, I mean, there are small models like uh, uh, NORCAD in Sudbury, you know, so that's that's a test mine. Mm -hmm. So if you had something in the on the mining side, uh, what we're talking about here is more on the processing side. But yeah. but you know, so so you know, NORCAD, if you had uh, a different piece of equipment, uh, a truck or a truck alternative or uh, surveying, you know, something, something you'd want to do in a mine, you know, there, that would be the place to go to on the processing side. It would be less obvious, uh, but there are examples that I could think of, like, for example, Woodgrove with the uh, stage flotation reactor where they, you know, had to go to a mine in, uh, in Atlantic Canada, in, invest in it and, you know, prove their technology that way. Uh, uh, consortia would be another uh, uh, way where you you know get different different mining companies to try that, and the uh, CMIC, the Canadian Mining Innovation Council, works on that that model where you know uh, you'd get a few miners together, you'd get a few uh, uh, service providers or equipment providers together, and as a group of let's say ten would try out a piece of equipment at one of the existing mines and then share that knowledge, share that risk. So so there are ways to do it. It's it, capital would be one, but that's not the the only hurdle, and there are ways to to overcome many of these. Yeah, we we have our, our Crownsman Energy show, and there's there's a lot of that going on in the energy sector. You know, they're creating organizations that then test all this, that they can that gets redistributed out to the industry, and um, 
is is mining doing more of that sort of thing now that sort of shared technology focus and investment in the technology or is it still pretty i mean it used to be you know two mines didn't even share the same road you know that sort of thing um is, is that still part of the industry or is it or are they is there more merging together uh, or collaboration i should say uh there's collaboration there's more that could be done I'll, I'll just go on a tangent like uh at share we have uh several technologies and one of them is how to bring uh, oil sands to market. The issue in Alberta is there's a constraint on the uh, pipelines that bring it to market. So we've approached several uh, oil companies and they've told us the same thing. Uh, can we please work as a group? You know, let's say three oil companies. And that's very different from mining. So the, the, the oil people uh, like sharing the risk instead of just one of them saying, no, we want that technology and we'll be the only ones that could bring the oil to market out of Alberta, you know, let's say to, to the United States or, or elsewhere. Uh, in mining, it tends to be the other way around. So we have a technology that will solve the arsenic in copper concentrates. The problem with copper is the world needs more copper, but most of the current projects are dirty copper. So they have high arsenic or high bismuth or high antimony or whatever. And uh, people have a lot of projects on the books, but the impurities prevent them from bringing it to market. So we have a technology that can handle high arsenic, let's say four or 5% arsenic, which is, which is very high. Uh, the copper people tend to look at it the opposite way. You know, they're saying, if we can take that technology, we'll be the only ones that know how to do this. Uh, would share it and, and, and bring that to market. So the uh, the interaction there are very different between oil and mining. But to answer your question, yeah, my, my first job was in Sudbury for uh, Falkenbridge and Inco and Falkenbridge mines are checkerboard. And it made a lot of sense if Inco could brought have brought some of Falkenbridge ore to, to the surface and, and vice versa. But that was never the paradigm. You know, each one, you know, kept it separate. And uh, you know that led to Inco going to Valley and Falkenbridge going to Extrata then Glencore. And if they had co cooperated over the years, who knows what would have happened to those great uh, Canadian uh, companies? So people, you know, do uh, cooperate, but not as much as as other industries. Yeah, you know, I and I. This is a little bit of a tangent as well, but uh, we are promoting CIM, and and I thought I've always been very impressed with CIM. You know, we came on the scene doing our show. Um, and it would be easy to ignore a little organization like ours, um, but then they they started collaborating with us, and I think that sort of says something about the mindset that is starting to come out in the mining industry, um, even even on a like the media level. Is that collaboration? It, it has to happen because if you're all just sitting there by yourselves, um, it's really hard to progress, especially when other countries and governments <laughs> aren't right. doing it that way. Uh, you can end up pretty weak. Um, but, but but with it, but but in Canada, you know, like the Canadian Mining Innovation Council, you know, does work on a collaboration. Uh, same with you know Australia, Amira, you know, where you have different companies collaborating and uh, sharing the risk and sharing the knowledge. So so, but the oil sands have the same. They have their COSIA, which uh, again they'll work together on uh, you know issues that are common to several oil companies. Yeah, yeah, we've had COSIA on the show. They they do some great work. Do you, and I actually it leads me to another question: is what how, where does Canada rank? Um, like where your outlook on how they are as a collaborating uh, unit, the collaborative unit in the mining sector, where do you, how do you think they compare to some, some other countries? People always point to Australia, you know, as, as being the, you know, the best in that area. So, you know, the Amiris have been going on for many, many years. So, you know, uh, a friend of mine, again, Boyd Davis said like, you know, people in Canada always say, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll read it in the newspaper and they'll say, oh, the Australians are doing that. You know, oh, I wish we had thought of that, you know, where we, we probably had thought of it. We just hadn't acted on it. So uh, I, I think uh, Australia in terms of funding for mining, in terms of funding for universities in, in mining and metallurgy, uh, the collaboration model tend to, tends to be higher. So Canada doesn't rank low, but it, it does tend to rank below some countries like Australia. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're sort of in the top, but you can al you can always be better. Um, I want to go. I want to pick on another piece of equipment um, that's sort of the main the mainstay. I might be might be creating enemies on the show. I don't know. <laughs> no. um, the the, flo the flotation cell. Now, um, 
I mean, I've helped clean these things up and <laughs> pulled them out of mines. And so I don't really know much about them from a technical standpoint, but I do know you, you shared a picture with me. Um, I think it's, it looks like a picture from 1909 um, and it looks pretty much exactly the same as the other ones I've seen. <laughs> so has that technology, has that pretty, been pretty stagnant or has there been progress in it as well? So yes and no. So as far as I can remember, I think the first patent for flotation was like 1902. Uh, the picture I sent to you was like 1909, 1910. So uh, yeah, if you looked at that picture and a, you know, a classic Denver cell, they, they would look very similar. Uh, people are always joking, you know, they're, they're saying, you know, if you took someone from 100 years ago and said, you know, uh, can you run a crusher and can you run a float cell and can you run a ball mill? And, and the answer is yes. Whereas if you took, uh, you know, let's say a pilot from 100 years ago and, and put them on a, you know, a modern jet, like the, the answer would be no to that. So, you know, so, so things, of course, improved. Uh, yeah, so we just so I don't make any enemies either. That there have been improvements in in a lot of areas, and uh, you know I'll I'll name three, and I'm, I'm sure there's others. Uh, I, I mentioned the Woodgrove stage flotation reactor, so that would be one improvement. Uh, the fundamental flaw with a flotation reactor is you have many things competing at the same time, so you're adding fine air into a turbulent area. So the, the, uh, the agitators at the bottom. So you, you're trying to enhance the interaction between the bubbles and the minerals, but at the same time, there's a lot of turbulence and the uh, bubbles tend to de detach or they rise to the surface. And if you've seen flotation, it tends to be very frothy and you have a nice stable area at the top. But if the, those aren't scooped out in time, then the minerals fall back down. So after all the, uh, energy and all the activity into getting the particle to float, a lot of them go back down. So they've broken that down into three separate units and that's the staged flotation reactor, which is three separate units. And that's a great improvement. Uh, there's other ones, for example, the Aries uh, hydro float where they're trying to float uh, coarser material. So you don't spend a lot of the energy in the ball mill to, to grind up material at, at, uh, that's not very efficient. And then there's the Jameson cell out of uh, Australia, which for some reason is very, very popular in Australia. But when they tried to market it into the North American uh, market, it became very difficult. People uh, discounted it and, and wouldn't even give it a try. So uh, here you have you know, three companies that have tried to uh, overcome the inefficiencies of the traditional flotation cell with different approaches, and each one you know, uh, you know, does have it, their advantages as, as well. So, so people have looked at it, and, and, and as well, you, know, you could certainly optimize the existing flotation cell. Uh, you could put cameras on the froth. You could put, uh, you know, uh, uh, sensors, you, you could put uh, advanced control, advanced process control to improve the uh, process. People, you know, of course, column flotation was another advancement that came out of McGill, uh, you know, decades ago. So, so yes, it's not like every flotation plant would look like it, it did in 1909. Uh, fundamentally, it's similar, but there's been great strides in that area, just so uh, we don't make too many en enemies by these comments. You know, I, I talk to a lot of people and I, I, people are, there's, I mean, of course there are people that, you know, want things to stay the same, but I think in general people are, I mean, it's a competitive world out there. So I think most people are pushing uh, and they do want to see, see it progress. And I think they want us to have these type of conversations. Um, well, uh, if, if I can go on a, a, a tangent with just, just our previous uh, discussion point. So people are saying or asking me the question, well, you know, why should I develop a new alternative to the ball mill? Uh, as soon as it comes on the market, I could be the first to be second. And if you were the, you know, the service provider that was going to build this alternative, uh, how do you know after spending millions of dollars in several years that it won't be knocked off and somebody else will come up, sorry, will come up with the alternative and, and come up with the second. And, you know, that's one of the Im impediments. It's like, well, why would I put in a million dollars times 10 and come up, you know, with the $10 million to develop the alternative? I'll just wait and then I'll be the 11th and don't have to put any money into it. So these are, you know, right. some of the uh, impediments that we hear. The other thing that I was wondering too is with this, because the, pro 
going on the processing side, it's so there's so many pieces of equipment that it takes to um, to to produce the final product. Is it the integration as well that when you change one thing, it, it sort of affects the whole the whole chain, it, or is that not really? Or most of these new technologies can they be integrated in fairly fairly simply? Uh, again, yes or no. It depends on on the site. Like if you're in a uh, like in, in Canada, the, the ball mills tend to be in some enclosed space. If you go to Africa, it, it's uh, outdoors and, and the ball mills are, you know, just, just sitting in, in, in the open. So if you're in a confined space and it's very tight and you have your ball mills and your crushers, and then someone came in with the alternative, uh, you know, it might be hard to shoehorn that into the existing operation. You know, whereas in other parts of the world, it would be no, you would just put it, put it mm. right next to it. So, so, you know, I would say it's geographic and, and what your plant looked like. Is that why, is that, do you think that's part of the reason like Australia, I would think that they would be able to have more outdoor, um, they don't have it enclosed, would that allow them to innovate a little or not allow them, but just make it a little bit easier or are they mostly closed in as well? I uh, know that, that that's interesting. Like when people come from Canada and all the you know, metallurgical plants are indoors and then they go to, you know, the Dominican Republic or Africa and then they see it outdoors, you know, to them, it's a shock and it's vice versa. So if you're, you know, coming from Australia uh, to Canada, you know, you say, well, why are you putting it, you know, indoors, you know, well, it depends if you came out, it was minus 40 or plus 40 would answer the question, but, but uh, <laughs> of course. yeah, but, but uh, you know, the integration is interesting. Like if, if you had the cam, the, the, the conjugal am, anvil hammer mill, uh, it might replace, let's say, a primary crusher, a secondary crusher, and maybe the ball mill itself. So if you were the producer of these three pieces of equipment, would you really like to invest in the cam, whereas you're now going to be selling one piece of equipment instead of three of them? Yeah. So that's uh, that's another uh, question that's interesting, which I can't answer, but it would be, uh, you know, a good question for the, for for the people who produce these uh, pieces of equipment. Well, I, I guess like Apple probably figured out at one point they went, well, that we will, we don't need a, we don't need all these little different devices. We make it all in one, and then we'll just sell it to everybody. <laughs> so I guess that would be the approach, wouldn't it? Yeah, but they're uh, they have a good model. In two or three years, it's either going to stop working or you're yeah. going to be having a model Apple four when everyone else has an eleven. Whereas when you buy a ball mill, you want it to last for thirty years, and you've you've sort of locked yourself into to the ball mill and your tailings pond and your crusher for the next thirty years. And if something better comes along, which it hasn't, then uh, you know what what do you do? Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, I guess a, a new uh, ball mill or a new new system every two years is probably not going to be well received. Um, I want to jump over to the open pit mining. Um, there was you sent a graph. We'll bring it up on the screen. Uh, it's got it's sort of traditional open pit mining to micro factories with geo steering and horizontal drilling. So when I saw the horizontal drilling, of course, I was thinking, well, that's more like the oil field stuff. And so I'm not even going to try to understand it. I'm just going to ask you what that is. We'll bring it up on the screen. Um, I looked up some videos in that. It's quite interesting. And it's it's new to me. Um, I'm sure a lot of people in the industry have heard of it, but I hadn't. So could you just walk us through that, Nathan? Okay, so let me describe the current state. And we'll just pick uh, open pit like you suggested. And let's pick gold just as an example. Okay, so, you know, I've worked at Barrick, I worked at McEwen Mining, so, so I'm familiar with those. So if you explain the current state to anyone in mining, this makes perfect sense to them. If, you, if I explain what I'm going to explain to someone like Elon Musk or someone outside of mining, they would think we're crazy. So let's say we take a typical open pit mine. So you know, you might have a strip ratio of five to 10 to one. So let's say five to one. So I got to move five tons of waste to get to one ton of ore. That one ton of ore contains about one gram per ton of gold. Right now, the gold price is high. So you'll go to places where the, the grade is 0 0.5, 0 0.8, but let's keep the math simple. We'll say one gram per ton. So at a strip ratio of five to one, I got to move six tons of material to get one gram of gold. And of, yeah, and, and out of that one gram per gold, I'm going to, you know, crush it up and grind it up perhaps and put it on a heap leach pad 
and get about 60, 70 percent of the gold. So after all that, I've I've explored, I've mined, I've moved it, I've crushed it, I've leached it. I'm still leaving one third of all the gold I've ever found in that heap leach operation. So the current operation is again, 6 million grams of ore, uh, not ore, of material to get one gram of gold ore and only recover 60. So, so I have to be moving tons and tons of material. So you, you'll see, open pits, you know, it'll take you like half an hour to an hour to go round and round the pit to get to the bottom of it, bring it back up, and then, you know, process it. So, you know, that's the current paradigm. So if fuel is free, and trucks are free, and manpower is free, you know, th this is a great, great operation. But, you know, there must be a better way to do it. So, so the other operation is, can we go to more continuous or, or, uh, uh, I guess, laparoscopic, you know, when they do surgery, they don't just, you know, take off your arm, they just laparoscopically, you know, get the part that they're, they're looking for. So why can't we do that in mining? Why can't we just go after the one gram of gold instead of the 6 million grams of, of all that waste material? So that, that that's more of that, that paradigm. So people, you know, are looking, or, or the other thing is, is called ISL or I. SR in situ leaching or in situ recovery and just leach the material that we're interested in. So this is done in uranium. This is done in copper. Uh, it's not really done in gold because most of the gold plants are, are uh, using uh, cyanide and people aren't really happy about pumping, you know, all the cyanide in and hoping you bring it up. But, you know, obviously there's, there's groundwater issues. So you'd have to find it another uh, lixiviant, another leaching reagent like thiosulfate. So uh, what you're describing is going away from the current paradigm to something more uh, targeted, like a factory where you're just uh, trying to get the gold. Uh, th th that was the expression out of uh, Anglo gold, you know, all the gold, only the gold all the time. Right. Do you think, Nathan, and I know this is a big question, but do you think in 50 years um, we will be digging giant holes in, in the middle of the mountain? Like, is that realistic or will this technology move, move into the industry, even if it's over time, even if it's in small operations or, you know, the big mining operators that have five or 10 mines all over the world, just do it on one. Will it eventually switch over? Uh, you remind me of a, uh, quote, I don't know if you know Niels Bohr, he's a, a Nobel Prize physicist and a philosopher, and his quote was, uh, the problem about uh, prediction is difficult, especially if it's about the future. Mm. So uh, it, I always joke, like, I think the mind of the future will look exactly like it is now, because, you know, 50 years ago, to now the mines, you know, the, the crusher, the ball mill, the, the, the whatever looks the same, but I, I not, but seriously, you know, I do think things are changing and, and no, I, I don't think civil society will allow us to continue doing what we do. Uh, I think the advantage in the past is that there aren't a lot of mines in downtown Vancouver or New York city or Toronto. So people in general don't have a, you know, appreciation of what a mine looks like. But now with technology, you know, if you have a dam break in Brazil within five minutes, everybody on the planet is going to see this in real time. So, you know, some of the things we've done in the past is because people don't really know what we're doing. Like, for example, 5% of the energy going into a ball mill. Most people don't know that. But now that I've told you this, what are, what are, what are you going to do about it? Now that you see what, you know, a, a, a tailings dam looks like, you know, will you allow this to go forward? So, so I think uh, civil society will force us or innovative, innovators from outside mining who are now interested in mining, for example, like the Elon Musks of the world, uh, you know, he'll he'll look at our practices and say either do better or he'll say I can do better, and then you know we'll we'll get some some innovation. So I think the technology has come to the has increased enough that uh, things that are going around us will will now be implemented in mining, and this will allow us to make improvements in uh, the areas of uh, you know not just digging big holes in in the earth or big 
you know, in, in mountains and so forth. So, so I, the answer is yes. I, I think the mine of 50 years from now will be very different than the mines of today. Do you think, uh, is it, is it people like Elon Musk? And I can't remember what he, he launched. You'd probably know of it. He launched, um, a couple of initiatives that he would fund certain types of mines and things. And hopefully, you know, because I just can't remember exactly what the details were off the top of my head. Are, are, are people like him going to drive change from that outside, that outside pressure? Uh, in my opinion, yes. So uh, he's, he's uh, looking for lithium in Nevada would, would be one example. And more recently he announced, uh, I'm not sure what the words mean, but he said he wanted to be advisor to the Goro project in New, New Caledonia, the the the, uh, the valley mine in New Caledonia. So I don't know if advisor meeting, uh, showing them how to mine or buying their nickel or or directing them, you know, what he's looking for. But but so you know, there's two examples. He needs nickel and he needs lithium, and he's been associated with with both those mining operations. What what he said was quite interesting. Uh, you know, he said the world needs more nickel. And it wasn't full stop. Like uh, everyone knows that the world needs more nickel. The world needs more copper. Uh, the world needs more nickel for the batteries for electric vehicles. But the world needs more copper to get the electrons from the grid to those uh, vehicles. So, yeah. so it's the batteries for the, the cars plus the electrification of them. But his he said he needs more nickel, but green nickel. So he's not saying the price. Of course, he wants a low price, but he also wants it uh, environmentally sustainable. So, uh, you know, that's that's rare. When I started in the industry 30 years ago, by the way, I have to change my CV. Somebody once told me if your CV says 30 years, they think of you as old. If they say 20 years plus, then you have experience. So, so, <laughs> so remind me to change. I it. don't have either one of those. So, it doesn't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but, you know, when I started, the questions were, you know, how many uh, cents per kilowatt hour do I have to pay? Uh, how many dollars per liter of water do I have to pump? And now the questions are, are different. The first question is like, what's the CO2 footprint? Uh, you know, I don't have water because I'm competing with the farmers in Peru, or I have uh, saline water in, in uh, Australia or in Chile where I got to pump it 400 kilometers from, from the coast and then desalinate the water. So how do I get around that? You know, can I do flotation with, with the salty water? So the questions are, are different. So his question is not how much does it cost per pound of nickel? It's, you know, uh, I don't want cobalt associated with child labor. I don't want gold associated with mercury in the water. I don't want nickel, you know, that that's not uh, green, you know, that that comes from a high CO2 footprint. So, so his questions are forcing us to, to answer them and to look for alternatives to the way uh, ways we're doing them. So, you know, five years ago, nobody was asking about uh, blockchain and cobalt, but now they want to prove that the cobalt came from some, you know, mine and not from some child labor, uh, you know, picking through cobalt through in the DRC or wherever. Yeah, I think uh, on a very positive outlook, I, I think someone like Elon Musk, um, because there's there's some serious cash behind him um, and around him <laughs> everywhere. I mean, I, is that um, I think. I think if there's the right moves forward, someone like him can actually progress it and get things over the line, um, as opposed to sort of this, I mean, I mean, look what he did with cars, right? I mean, that if you look at the whole scope of how long it took him to get that to be a mainstay, one of the top car companies in the world, it really didn't take that long because I think his vision is very clear once he goes after um, making a change in an industry. Yes, no doubt, uh, you know, just his, his name, you know, if you issue the press release that your nickel company had a phone conversation with his secretary, you know, your stock will double. So, but it has <laughs> to look up positive. Your site, then, then you're, <laughs> then you're good. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I wanted to just, there's, you know, I mean, Nathan, these are actually, uh, and I've had a few of these, these interviews over the years that are actually quite tough for me because there's so much I want to talk to you about. I, I hope we get you back on the show because I, you know, these, an hour is a long time. 
but it's also very short amount of time. So there's a couple things I want to talk about um, leading out is who's done it really well. And I also like we had a company called Rail Veron. I think you're familiar with them. Um, and I want you to touch on a couple companies that have even within the traditional mining world have introduced really innovative products and not even not even innovative as then they changed the whole game but they just offered a much more efficient solution are there a couple that stand out to you that you could highlight um yeah i'll just name a couple of companies i'm not trying to be exclusive or no, you know no. prom promoting anyone you know but but uh you know uh, over the years i've always thought of uh, agnical ego as being innovative uh, then the precious metals with what they've done in uh, Bulgaria is, is, is innovative. Uh, you know, share it uh, where, where I work, you know, we, we have some great technologies and, uh, you know, we over 40 uh, company, over 40 mines in the world use share technology to, pr to produce metal. So we, we do produce nickel and cobalt, but we also, you know, do work for, for other companies. Uh, you know, there's, there's the, the, the uh, produce uh, the, the people who do produce equipment, you know, for example, the the Jamesons and the the Woodgroves and 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 the, the areas and so forth, uh, the barracks who switched the gold strike mine from uh, cyanide to thiosulfate, yeah. you know, so so the, you know those would be examples. If you ask about rail there, so uh, again, it's another example of the speed of adoption. So rail there is out of Sudbury, you know, it's been around for, you know, decades. Uh, it took a lot of time to get the Incos of the world to try it or to promote it, but you have to give credit to Agnico, which, you know, uh, quickly for, for, you know, them, like not, not the development, the rail there or the test work that Inco is doing, but, you know, the, the adoption in their mind, because, because it is a, it's a very interesting uh, technology. So, you know, people always by default think of mining trucks, but I can give you a long list of alternatives. You know, the rail there would be one, uh, new trans would be another. Uh, Fred Stanford, who worked at Inco, couldn't get traction there, but now that he has the power at uh, Torex in, in Mexico with his Makahai, you know, he, you know, he's, he's developing that. So that would be an alternative to, to the truck. So, uh, 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 rope conveyors, uh, pipelines, uh, injection hoisting, Roy Slack at cementation, you know, so, you know, I, I can give you a log list, which we could share with the audience, but, you know, there's like at least 10 uh, alternatives and rail there would be one of them. Because once again, if, if you're putting a big mining truck underground, there's no way for them to turn around. So you have to have blast out an area where they can kind of make a, you know, a, you know, the a reverse turn. Uh, you have to move all that air. At that time, it was all diesel trucks. So, so you have to move all the air and heat that mine uh, or heat the air, you know, going, you know, just, just because the, the truck is the wrong piece of equipment. So uh, people, you know, are looking at uh, ex uh, uh conveyors or uh, rail veyors that, you know, can be used underground and in other applications. So yeah, that, that's, that, that would be one specific example. Well, I think with rail veyor, I think there's up to, it's like up to, I mean, and they, and they, they weren't just saying it, they really outlined it on our show. I think it was 80% increase in efficiency in some, in, not in every case, of course, but in some cases it can be that high. It's, it's staggering. Um, what about, I wanted, you, you mentioned the cyanide and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not an expert and I never pretend to be on the show. So I did want to talk about that Barrick uh, Gold project. Um, you sent me an article on that as well. And I thought it was quite interesting. I just wondered if you could sort of unpack it a little bit. Sure. So the de facto way of, of uh, leaching gold is cyanide. And it's been around for a hundred years. Uh, the good thing and the bad thing is it's very efficient. It, it works really well. It's reasonably priced. It's like the sledgehammer. It, it, you know, it works. It's hard to replace it because it, it works so well. Mm. But if you want to look at other applications, 
uh, for example, in situ leaching, you're like I said before, you're not going to pump uh, gallons and gallons of, of cyanide and underground and then try to recover, you know, recover it back to surface. So the barrack one was not done for that reason. It was done for a technical reason. Uh, their flow sheets have a roaster and an autoclave. And the problem with some of their ore is refractory. It, it means it leaches well. But if you have any carbon there, the leach door reattaches itself to the carbon. So you, you, can't, you don't get good recoveries because you can't get the gold out, out of the solution. So the way around it was to use thiosol, uh, thiocyanate. It's a fancy word, but, but all it is, is, is it's a fertilizer. So you know if, uh, if cyanide went to fell on the ground, that would be dangerous. If thiosulfite fell on the ground, all that would do is the grass would grow faster than, than it normally does on your roads. So it's a fancy name for a fertilizer, but it leaches gold. And they uh, switched the autoclave circuit from cyanide to thiosulfate. And it was the only circuit uh, at that scale in the world, like production le level of scale, where you make gold using a non-cyanide lixivian. So in short, uh, it, it's just a different leaching reagent to cyanide and their gold strike autoclave circuit was converted to it uh, several years ago. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's so fun having someone like you on the show because a lot of times when you have a, a guest on, you know, they're, you know, they're a producer of a certain type of equipment. So they really have to stay in their lane and I appreciate it. And then we sort of have all these NDAs that we have to follow. <laughs> it can be quite complex having these interviews. So it's kind of refreshing to just be able to ask some of these questions. Um, for you, you've had such a, you, you've had um, so much experience in the industry and you've worked for several companies how do you navigate it? I mean, there is the understand. There's an academic understanding of mining. There's a public act um, understanding. There's the companies themselves, the operators. There's the equipment. How do you how do you navigate um, all those different points of contact that you really do have? Um, From an opinion standpoint, just just getting your ideas and and working through those those different topics. Right. From the public point of view, uh, my personal opinion is, is the public's knowledge of what we do is, is very low. So, you know, we can point out that, you know, hey, you need us if you want an iPhone, you know, there's like, a, you know, 50 metals or whatever it is in an iPhone. And, you know, if it's not for mining, you know, you would be using uh, something else. So, but that doesn't work, you know, people's appetite for seeing tailings, disasters, or, you know, chimneys belching, you know, smoke and SO2 and arsenic up it, you know, the, their people's appetite is like, no, we don't want that, you know, that's not a fair trade off. So the metals that we produce have to be done to their satisfaction, that they're the consumers, but their knowledge of what we do. I think, I think, honestly, if you walked around Toronto, and you asked 100 people, what's mining, they would tell you like, we're, we go with uh, mules and pickaxes, or we're down at the side of a river trying to pan for gold, you know, they, they, they think that's the industry, or something not so nostalgic, something uh, like the, uh, the yahoos at the gold rush, if you see that, that the show on TV, which doesn't do a lot of I, I have never been able to quite get get through one of those episodes. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like where they're dredging through a river with some big truck and you know, yeah, devastating yeah. the landscape, you know, that that doesn't help us. So we don't do a good job of, of educating the public of, uh, you know, what modern mining looks like or could look like, as opposed to just telling them, hey, you, you need our nickel for batteries and you need our gold for jewelry, you know, that that argument doesn't really fly. No. Uh, so, you know, the other ones are, are easier, you know, people that understand uh, mining. So, you know, if you're talking about the academic institutions, if you're talking about, uh, you know, the, the equipment suppliers, you're talking about the other mining companies, they get it. But if you don't mind, if I can just go on a short tangent, uh, I was part of the, uh, the NSERC, that's the Natural Science Engineering Research Council, and uh, I was part of the discovery grant. So this is the government entity that gives funding to the universities. Uh, in my case, NANSERC, which is the engineering and, and hard sciences. So I was one of the few in my cohort of 50 people. There were two of us from industry, me and a woman from Shell. 
And I was one of the few on the mining side. Uh, most of them were chemical engineering and sort of lumps uh, mining metallurgy and chemical engineering together. So I was left with the, the task of defending mining and, and mining innovation because, you know, they would, the mining professors would have a proposal. We want to increase the ball mill efficiency by 5%. And the chemical engineering professors would say, ball mills, are you still using ball mills? And then they would say 5%, like you're 5% efficient. Now you want to get to 10%. You know, if you told that to Elon Musk, he'd want it to be like 80% efficient. Right. So, so, you know, here for each proposal that came up, you know, here we want to put in a new sensor on the ball mill to increase efficiency, you know, and it, they would always, you know, vote these things down where, you know, whereas, you know, I was left saying, do you know how important mining is to the, in, to the country? Do you know how much we need our nickel and cobalt? Do you know how many jobs are in mining? Do you know, you know, the, the importance of mining to the world? And, you know, this is their impression. And these are people who, you know, not the general public, these are engineering professors who happen to not be in mining. So even there, you know, we have a lot of work to do to, to, you know, convince the government that, you know, we need this type of funding as much as the other disciplines. But, but what you said earlier too, is that, that that's well to the public anyway, I guess you were referring to public, not, not to academia and, and government. Um, you like to the public, that argument doesn't hold up that, oh, you need us. So, you know, that's, it, it's like, well, we need, we need cars, but there can be a completely different way to do cars. Um, have you found, have you found an argument um, or, or is it on the mining industry that that's really what it comes down to? Is it, is it up to the mining industry to actually propose solutions that aren't a 5% increase in efficiency? It's not a new sensor, which, I mean, I love that technology. We've had lots of features on it, but is there another level that the mining needs to expect of themselves? Yeah. It's like the old CSR argument. So you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, you would go to some community and you would build them a curling rink. Okay, well, that, that doesn't fly anymore. You know, the CSR is not charity anymore. It's, you know, what, what does the community get out of the mine? And, it, and it's not just, if you're going to, let's say in the middle of nowhere, Argentina or Mexico, it's not just the low, level jobs where you're holding a sign at the side of a highway, you know, for the truck to, to pass the, the road, you know, that's not the kind of jobs they're looking for anymore. So it's like, what, what are the jobs? What are the benefits to the community? Don't uh, ruin our water. You know, the, we've been living here 5,000 years and you're going to come for 20 years and, you know, remove the top of some Andy mountains, you know, it's like, you know that, that that those these things don't fly anymore. So right. you know what, what will happen after the the mine is gone? Will there still be jobs? Will there still be high paying jobs? Will you send our students to university to become surveyors and engineers and technicians? Uh, so the argument if you're if you're in Australia and you have a fly in fly out operation, and you're paying two hundred thousand dollars for the driver of the truck and the flying them and you have to feed them and clothe them and house them. Maybe that makes sense to have a, a driverless truck, an automated truck. If you're in Mexico where the reason they're allowing you to put in the mine is for the, 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 the jobs and some of the jobs are truck drivers, then to explain to them that you want driverless trucks doesn't fly. That's, that's not of right. any benefit right. to them. So, so the technology exists. But the case in Australia and the case in Mexico might be very different if you could do it or not do it. Yeah, I mean that must. Yeah, it's a real challenge. Um, and it's. Do you think? Yeah. Oh, I already asked you if if you think we would get there. It's. I mean, it's. <laughs> it's almost like this interview has opened up more questions <laughs> as we cover each topic. But that is the reality. Do you think? Um, are our companies? Are companies getting better at going into those environments where are they getting better at offering value outside of putting a driver in a vehicle when it's un unnecessary, if that, if that makes sense? Are they getting better at offering other, uh, other opportunities? They are. Uh, they are because now they're not thinking of 
uh, CSR as charity. There, there are people out there, uh, I'll just mention one, there's many, uh, Monica Ospina from O-Trade. She works with the local communities. What do the communities need? And what can the communities offer to the mining company? So, you know, she's might be paid by the mining company, but her her interest is the local community. And, and I'm just picking on one. I have a lot of friends who are in there. So, so the answer is yes. The miners are getting more sophisticated in offering uh, solutions to the local communities and the designs of the mine that you know, impact their, 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 where they've lived forever. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm more optimistic as ever on uh, the CSR side of it, as well as the mining innovation technology side of it, that, uh, you know, the, the mine of the 50 years from now future won't look like the mine now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it, it's actually quite exciting. And I think, um, you know, sometimes you have to play, you know, in this interview a little bit, playing the devil's advocate. Um, to get to an actual, you know, in-depth conversation about it. I think the other thing I would add too is a little thing. It's a very small contribution that our show makes is, but this, these conversations are public. Anybody can see it. It's not in a closed room. You know, you can just go online. If somebody is interested in learning about mining, they, shows like ours are starting to pop up and people can just go there. And I will say we're getting sponsors, the mining industry. I mean, we've got money coming from the mining industry that's sponsoring these shows, which is a signal we want the we want that information out public. Um, so it's it's really good. Um, Nathan, thank you for coming on the show. Um, it's it really is fun to talk to you. I, I I don't know exactly how we'll make another show happen here in the next few months, um, but I, I think there's just so much more to talk about. So I, I hope you will come back on the show because I really do think there's some important topics to cover. It's been my pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, Gaudi, um, I'll be honest, everyone. I I love do I loved doing that interview. Um, but I, I was looking at topics and I was just like, I wish I, I, I mean, I could talk, I could ask Nathan probably for two more hours, but, uh, he might just hang up on me after. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's got so much knowledge. Um, that's obvious why CIM wanted him to come on the show and, and talk. Yeah. Um, and I will say anybody watching, uh, tune into CIM May 3rd to 6th. Yep because it's people like Nathan that are doing the talks that are unpacking these topics and looking at different initiatives in the mining industry. There's going to be a ton of information. It's going to be very well done. I hope you join us. Gaudi, where can people follow, subscribe, comment, suggest guests, be sponsors, all that fun stuff for the mining now? All right. Well, definitely subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've got two episodes a week on there. Um, like always, we are working super hard to make that three episodes um, a week. Uh, but so yeah, definitely subscribe if you want to be part of the show, whether it's Mining Now, Crownsman Show, or Crownsman Energy, contact us, info at crownsman.com. Um, and then just follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, anywhere. <laughs> LinkedIn has just gone crazy. It has, yeah. We're Every definitely I, super active on LinkedIn. I, had, I don't have my notifications on on my phone. I just because I, 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 I check when I want to check, but yeah. it's just like, especially Rory, it's crazy. Um, okay. <laughs> He's wild. <that> <laughs> He's wild, man. Okay. Thank you everybody for watching. Thank you, Nathan, for coming on the show. Thank you to everybody for supporting Mining Now. Make sure to check out uh, CIM May 3rd to 6th. Um, if you think this show had good information, there will be loads of that for three days straight. It's going to be lots of fun. Thank you, everyone. See you on the next episode.